A very good evening, everyone. On behalf of the IIP Digital team, I, Dr. Manisha Tarpalikar, welcome all of you for today's event. First of all, let me take this occasion and let me wish all of you a very happy World Physiotherapy Day. To celebrate this day, the Indian Association of Physiotherapists Thane District Branch is conducting a webinar on overview of role of physiotherapy in diabetic patients and starting a diabetic clinic in the physiotherapy setup. This is the first webinar conducted by this newly formed Thane district team. Congratulations to this team. The speaker for the webinar is Dr. R. Arunachalam. Sir is a professor and head of the department at the College of Physiotherapy, Madhav University, Rajasthan. The moderator for this session is Dr. Nikita Ghadge. We are live streaming on the official IP India YouTube channel. I request all participants to sus subscribe to this channel to receive updates and to view upcoming webinars. If the participants have any questions for the speaker, I request them to kindly put them in the chat box. These will be answered at the end of the session. I now request Dr. Nikita to kindly take over. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening to one and all present for this webinar organized by the Indian Association of Physiotherapists, Maharashtra State, Thane District Team. Today, the 8th of September is a very special day for us, being in this noble profession, whether be as a student, a graduate, an academician, a researcher, or a clinical practitioner. We proudly acknowledge this day by celebrating as the World Physiotherapy Day as the World Confederation for Physical Therapy, the WCPT, was found on the same day in the year 1951. We are celebrating the 70th year of World Physiotherapy. This day celebrates the unity and solidarity of the global physical therapy community. It is a chance to recognize the contributions that physical therapists provide to their patients and the community. And on this special occasion, we, the Thane District team, have got this wonderful opportunity to launch our team with its first event. To begin with the event, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the IEP Central team, Dr. Sanjeev Jha, Central President, Dr. Suresh Babu Reddy, Vice President, Dr. A.M. Annamalai, General Secretary, Dr. Ruchi Vashne, Treasurer, Dr. Joji John, National Head Branch Coordination Committee, Dr. Nehal Shah, Joint Secretary, West Zone, Dr. Sudeep Kale, West Zone CEC, Dr. Achal Vashi, West Zone CEC. And now, I would like to warmly welcome the major support system for us district teams, the dignitaries present for the webinar from the Maharashtra State Team. Dr. Ujwal Yavle, President, Dr. Amit Gire, Vice President, Dr. Bharti Dave, General Secretary, Dr. Darshana Trivedi, General Secretary, Treasurer, Dr. Mansi Mehta, Joint Secretary, the EC members, Dr. So Dr. Sohan Selkar, Dr. Sanjay Rajhans, Dr. Rahul Deshmukh, Dr. Asmita Moharkar, Dr. Suvarna Ganvir, Dr. Suraj Kanse, Dr. Uttara Mohan, and Dr. Snehal Patel. We welcome you all. Now, I would like to request Dr. Ujwal Yavle, sir, to please address the event. Thank you, Dr. Nikita. So, first of all, uh, wish you all physios, the Thane district team, all AC members, the participants, the resource person, a happy World Physiography Day. Dear colleagues, um, just to begin with, as all of us are well aware that, like other professionals, all physios also. During last one and a half year, clinicians, academicians, all also have tried to sustain themselves and have worked upon so as they have come up with the new ideas, re-establishment, okay, and then further working on setting up their own clinics. So there are many new ideas which are coming up, which include collaborations with collaborations with the consultants, joining hands with other healthcare professionals, and so has 
is you know, complementing even the physios who are working in the same area. I'm really happy uh, that Thane District has come up with this innovative uh, topic for the discussion. There's a new and a big scope of physiotherapists who are working in a diabetes. India, and in fact, the whole Asian uh, countries are considered to be the capital of diabetes. So there would be the maximum people all over the world when we consider India or the Asian countries who would be suffering from the diabetes. So in fact, there stands a big role of exercise, fitness, then lifestyle modification to prevent the diabetes to happen as well as to prevent the further complications of this condition. So I'm really happy and congratulate Thane District for organizing such a nice event. And I'm very sure after attending this webinar, many of the physios would start with physiotherapy setup, especially for diabetes clinic. So thank you. Thank you all for having me here. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. I would, I, I would now like to call upon Dr. Bharti Dave, ma'am, to speak a few words. Good evening to one and all. And uh, wish you very happy World Physio Day on behalf of entire Maharashtra team. It's my pleasure to talk about uh, today's event as uh, this is one of the uh, different topic, what I could say. And uh, really proud to have uh, such a strong team who have in short notice arranged different topic and uh, really useful one for all, uh, all of us. I hope this is going to get a new uh, platform for all of us to add on in your clinical practice and establish more firm with our patient treatment. Good luck to this team. Uh, Nikita, you want me to introduce your team, Thane District team? Uh, I mean, Thane District team. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you uh, can go ahead with that also. Nikita was very excited that ma'am should announce our name. So I don't mind as uh, this is my favorite team. All are my favorite. But yes, y'all are known to me and y'all are working very hard. So proud of all of you. And congratulations to one and all Thane District team. To start with, we have Venkat Ramesh, sir, convener, uh, Dr. Jay Pathak as secretary, Dr. Pratiksha Dige as a treasurer, and uh, our EC members are Dr. Suraj Shukla, Dr. Nikita Gadke, Dr. Gaurav Tripathi, Dr. Swapnil Mate, and Dr. Uh, Ravi Prakash Singh. So these are all a uh, team of Enthu people who have joined to form a strong Thane district team. So welcome you all on the board and congratulations to all the team members. And uh, today's message to one and all, whoever is hearing uh, this topic, uh, I'll advise do not leave incomplete because many more things at the end of the session will be announced. And good luck to you all. And without wasting the time, over to you, Nikita. Thank you, ma'am, for your inspiring words. This means a lot to us. And we definitely, as a team, promise you to withhold this trust and opportunity given to us by the central and the state team and work in the best way we can. I would now like to request Dr. Darshana, ma'am, to speak a few words. Um, hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nikita, uh, for the introduction. And um, uh, thank you, Thani District, uh, for calling me in this uh, as a panelist. Uh, this is actually a very nice topic. And I, myself being a clinician, I would actually love to be uh, in this webinar. And uh, thank you so much uh, for this. And um, all the best, Thani District team. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Now we go ahead with the webinar and welcome our respected speaker, Dr. R. Arunachalam, sir. 
Dr. R. Arunachalam is presently designated as professor and HOD at College of Physiotherapy, Madhav University, Rajasthan. He has pursued PhD in physiotherapy, master's in neurology, PG diploma in diabetic education from CMC Velour, fellowship in diabetic education, MSc Yoga and Naturopathy. We welcome you, sir. Over to you. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, sir. Uh, very good afternoon to uh, good evening to everyone. This is a very auspicious day, and I hope uh, this is a very busy day for everyone. Uh, but I'm so happy to be in connect with uh, one of the pioneers in the field of physical therapy, uh, Dr. S. V. Ramesh, sir. And uh, I really congratulate the uh, Pune district team, IAP team, for organizing this program. Actually, uh, organizing this program, uh, every program nowadays it's become very easy because uh, it's Zoom platform, uh, if you catch up in a uh, resource person, you can go with that topic, not an issue, but uh, your hand picking the topic uh, is very important. So, uh, Dr. Ravi Prakash and uh, Dr. S. V. Ramesh, sir, both of them were very particular about this topic because they were highly impressed and they wanted to give. Uh, what they perceive to be the uh, best topic for the uh, their uh, predominantly clinician population. So uh, I congratulate uh, everyone who is associated here, uh, Dr. Jay Patak, Dr. Uh, Bharti Dave, Dr. Ujwal, uh, Dr. Suraj, Dr. Uh, Pratishtha, Dr. Nikita, Dr. Gaurav, Dr. Darshna, and uh, Dr. Swapnil and Dr. Nikita. So I have read through all the names because uh, you have all put your hands up in uh, conducting this program and making it a grand success. Thank you so much. And I sincerely apologize to the organizers for my delay and uh, the inconvenience. Actually, I had come over uh, nearly 400 kilometers away from Chennai to attend one uh, physical program, which uh, is happening after two years in that place. So it was wonderful meeting the students and uh, really I was not able to finish my talk uh, with the students. So it has stretched for another 15 20 minutes. I sincerely apologize for that. So without wasting much time, I would like to share my uh, PowerPoint. Can you please tell me whether it is visible? Yes. Thank you so much. So our topic today is diabetes educator, diabetic educator, which is uh, highly needed in the future for the uh, Indian community. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, in this short uh, talk about what is the need for the diabetic educator, who is a diabetic educator, and how physiotherapists are fitting exactly into this bill of uh, diabetic educator, and what is the future for this. Fine. So when it all started, you know, uh, when uh, I came across this program, which was conducted in the Christian Medical College, which is a very prestigious college in uh, down south. Uh, uh, it is in Velour district. So when we were, when we came to know about diabetic education and diabetic educator program, we all were taken by surprise. What is this actually? How physiotherapists are eligible for this? Uh, but now actually, if you see CMC Velour is doing this program only for MBBS students. Uh, MBBS uh, people who have completed MBBS, for them only this is eligible. They have stopped doing this for physical therapists. I don't know uh, what is the politics behind that, but we are the exact person who fit into this bill of diabetic educator and we can uh, very easily open up a diabetic clinic of our own if we have some basic amenities. So that is what I'm going to discuss with you now. So, in uh, my previous college, we did a study uh, where we uh, asked physiotherapists to prioritize their aims, uh, problem list aims and a treatment for a given scenario. So, we did this cross-section study to know whether physiotherapists are prioritizing glycemic control in the management of uh, musculoskeletal problems of uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus or not. So, this is what our uh, main uh, aim was. So then what we did was we gave a case scenario uh, where a 49-year-old man presenting with severe low back pain for three, month, three weeks duration. 
He is unable to bend forwards. Severe burning sensation on his foot, presenting with left lateral trunk shift. Okay, so these are all illusionary words which we used, where physiotherapist will be more diverted. And we also inserted a small word like HbA1c was nine. Uh, tenderness over the L4, L5 paraspinal muscles, uh, weakness of bilateral hip abductors, extensors, and uh, spinal extensors. So we asked uh, all the physiotherapists, somewhere around uh, 300 physiotherapists, to uh, devise the problem list, the uh, aims of their management, and what is the physiotherapy intervention they will give for this particular patient. So they have to give three points. So it was very really surprising to see for us that uh, nearly uh, uh, more than a quarter of the patient only, less than a quarter of a patient only uh, came up with uh, priorities in the glycemic control. And the majority of them did not even mention this glycemic control in their uh, treatment or in the problem list or in the uh, aims of the management. So the numbers are missing here because I'm logged into uh, a different computer. So the numbers was 28% prioritized, uh, sorry, 18% only prioritized uh, glycemic control. And the remaining, whooping 82% of the people did not prioritize glycemic index at all. So, so this gives you a clear idea that for a physiotherapist, the tenderness, pain, weakness, uh, numbness, postural corrections, these are all the priority, but not the glycemic level. And we have to understand that if the glycemic control is not achieved, the peripheral neuropathic symptoms, uh, either it's sensory or motor, uh, it is not going to subset. So our success of treatment mainly uh, is revolving around this glycemic index. So that we have to understand, first of all, and uh, with this basic introduction, this research, I understood that most of the physiotherapists are not worried about diabetes. So why diabetic educator now? What is the role of a diabetic educator? What basically you have to do to become a diabetic educator? First is your knowledge and awareness about diabetes should increase. We all know that diabetes is an increased glucose level in the blood, okay, circulating glucose level. What are the uh, complications? What are the microvascular, macrovascular complications? How it can delay the uh, wound healing? How it can bring about uh, pain perception? What its role on the descending pain suppressing system? How it uh, irritates the nerve endings and causes illusionary pain? What is the role of diabetes in the central sensitization of pain? All these things we need to know. Okay, so when we know all these things, First, first hand, we will know what is the role of diabetes and glycemic levels in the management of pain-related physical therapy and paralysis in physical therapy. So we will know that. First, we have to address to the diabetes. Next is, uh, we are going a step ahead of uh, what we are uh, currently providing physical therapy to patients. And we are going one step ahead in a better physical therapy delivery when we attest to the uh, diabetes part of uh, the patient. So you, you will be showing yourself as a different person, a different physical therapist from the other physical therapist. Producing result not region specific. So you might have seen patients who are coming with shoulder pain. After three months, they'll be coming with leg, uh, knee pain. They'll be coming with back pain. So this is a, re it's not a region specific scenario when it comes to diabetes. It is a holistic uh, approach what is needed for them so that they don't recur with pain. And also, this the, the, if you attest to the diabetic part of uh, their uh, treatment, you are going to attain a better cardiorespiratory endurance and their quality of life is going to be enhanced by that. And the doors are opening for physical therapists as a diabetic specialist centers. And you can play a dual role. You can play a dual role. On Sundays, you can be a diabetic educator. And on the other days, you can be a physical therapist. Uh, and you, you will, your contribution to the society, your contribution to your patients, and your reputation is going to increase. So uh, this is a very good opportunity. And last but not least, you can be an entrepreneur. You can be a better entrepreneur than an entrepreneur. Of course, money is essential for everybody. And this is uh, one way of earning a much better income compared to uh, adopting some pseudosciences and uh, taking up short course and you can be a better entrepreneur. You can own a diabetic clinic and you can employ many professionals in this. And 
you can uh, what to say you can you can showcase your talents and you can showcase your profession in a much better way and i feel this is the best day for me to present about diabetic educator dimension of a digital test on a digital today and i'm really thankful to the uh, uh, unity for this so what is the latest projection so whenever you are going to start a business first thing what you will see is what is the scope for this what is the need for this uh, that is what we always think about so for that we are, what we will do is is there any demand for this uh, goods that's what we always see when we are starting a uh, business so in this clinic is there a demand in the future for a diabetic educator so let us see what the who the highest health body of the world is going to uh, Say uh, the uh, the forecast is like see uh, in the Southeast Asian countries this uh, the levels of diabetes is going to jump leaps and bounds in 2020. Okay, so in uh, 2000 it was uh, 176 million and in 2030 it is forecasted to be 370 million. So this is a worldwide scenario. So what about uh, the country-wise scenario? If you see, India is leading currently, as well as in 1995 also, India was leading uh, China, which has uh, a marginally better uh, population than us. We are leading them a marginal ratio. But in 2025, the forecast says that this gap between India and the second country is going to increase. And India is going to become the capital of uh, what to say, the uh, diabetes population. So, this is an alarming situation in India. And we are already the capital of diabetes and we are going to further worsen. This is the world map which shows the distribution of uh, diabetic population uh, in the world where we fall in line with most of the developed countries. In developed countries, the management has become much more stringent and they are adopting a better option because this diabetic educator has evolved a long time back. Why I'm saying this diabetic educator alone is, it's a strategy that has been worked out successfully in most of the countries. Now we are slowly catching up with that. And, and if you see India is uh, in the, uh, more than 12% of the population is already having diabetes. And if you see uh, all over the world, what is the distribution? 69.2 million Indians are having diabetes, which is far uh, more than the other countries. And if you see in India, every one person in 11 adults have diabetes. This is one scenario that is alarming. And the second scenario is even more alarming. That is, out of two diabetic patients, one diabetic patient is not diagnosed yet. So he is underdiagnosed. Uh, normally in Indian scenario, we, we diagnose diabetes only when we go for a uh, master health checkup or suddenly uh, there is a surgery, we go for a blood checkup. And you check blood one day, you find out your diabetes. So underdiagnosed people are more and they are equal to already present uh, population. That means we have a double amount of uh, diabetic load in India. Whatever is, uh, for example, you see, now it is 69 million means we almost have twice that. So that is a problem uh, in the future as well. So this is the numbers, number games we are seeing. So now what is the medical expenses? Because that is what very important, right? So the direct cost and indirect cost of diabetes in 2007, 2012, and 2017, if you see, the direct cost is increasing. The direct cost of uh, people spend on diabetes and diabetes management is increasing. So it's a potential area for uh, medical workers to invest their time and their clinic uh, into just change the direction of the clinic. You can earn more because more money is involved here. So don't think that I'm talking from uh, monetary perspective because that is also re uh, required for us uh, as an entrepreneur that is that's when we can uh, serve the community better of course this is a service industry but uh, we are charging our patients and we are charging for a good quality service that is what i'm i just meant here and uh, if you see if there is a complication if the patient is not having any complications the medical expenses are less but in case if the patient is having uh, 
microvascular complication, the expense becomes double. If he's having only macrovascular complication, again, the expense is increased. And if the patient is having both microvascular and macrovascular complication, the medical expenses is increasing leaps and bounds. And almost three times it increases. So from here, what we understand is the diabetic educator can concisely reduce the complications in uh, these diabetic patients and he can save the uh, patient's money. Though he's earning from diabetic patients, he's stopping them from going into complications. So in that way, it is a benefit for the patients uh, without any doubt. Okay. And uh, so these are the number of times the expenses increases. Now, if you see these numbers, then you muted, unmute yourself, please, sir. Thank you, sir. So, what is borderline diabetes? Uh, we have uh, the fasting and postprandial blood glucose level. If the blood glucose level goes past the blood glucose level goes beyond 126, we call them as diabetic. Or the uh, post prandial, if it goes more than 140, we call them as diabetic. But in case if the fasting is between 120 and 126, or the fasting is between 140 and 200, then we call them as borderline diabetic. It is otherwise called as impaired glycemic control, impaired glucose tolerance. Okay, so uh, in this scenario, these are like a cat on the wall, people who are sitting on the cat, on, like a cat on the wall. They can either become diabetic or they can become um, non-diabetic. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt, sir. Could you please yes. be a little louder? I think there are requests coming from the participants. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, Thank is you. that okay now? Yes, sir. Okay. So these people are uh, like the cat on the wall. They can become uh, diabetic in the due course of time, or they, if they take invasive measures, they can become uh, non-diabetic also. So uh, what matters here is the time duration uh, at which they have been diagnosed as uh, uh, pre-diabetic and what they do after they have been diagnosed as pre-diabetic, whether they are going for a uh, rigorous intervention or uh, they are going to ignore this, uh, expecting that to become normalized. That, that In this COVID scenario, this is a big headache for most of us. Okay, so now this pre-diabetic patients can be converted into a non-diabetic patients by means of proper counseling and by means of proper guidance, which is provided by the uh, diabetic. Here also the diabetic educator plays a very vital role. Now, so this is the ratio of uh, diabetes and pre-diabetes ratio that is present in India. Among 30 to 39 year old male, if you see, uh, sorry, uh, people, if you see, the pre-diabetics are more. So here, if we control this pre-diabetic properly uh, and monitor them properly, over a period of time, the, uh, the people who are getting converted into the red zone, that is the diabetic zone, will be diminished. So uh, it is better to go for an early intervention or early um, attention to these people. So as the age progresses from 60 to 69, if you see in 69 years, only 20 are uh, uh, pre-diabetic and 41% are being diabetic. So that says clearly that at the early stage, that is 30 to 39 years, proper screening and education about diabetes is very immense. People who are walking to pain clinics are predominantly pre-diabetic. So that, uh, that is a statistic to say. So who are the first visit practitioners and first contact for them uh, are the physiotherapists. So we are, the, uh, we are in the correct position to uh, screen these pre-diabetic people. So the high prevalence of glucose intolerance is even very common in South India, or that is very young adult, the people who are going to school. Uh, this is a uh, this is the scenario in 2007 where school students are also diagnosed to have diabetes and heart diseases. It is very heartening to know, but um, it's very clear that this is not only a scenario in South India after 10, 15 years, it is also catching up with tribal villages uh, like in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, Manipur, Mizoram. And the trend is not clearly understood in India. There are two, uh, uh, two uh, states which are close by, 
Manipur and Mizoram. Manipur shows more number of uh, uh, diabetic patients, whereas Mizoram shows less number of diabetic patients. But what is heartening is these tribal areas where people have people are living with nature, who are having a very good uh, uh, access to uh, uh, good natural food substances and uh, and uh, pollution free ambience are still susceptible to diabetes. So it is very difficult to understand how these people are also exposed to diabetes. So what are the common beliefs, which are uh, myths, that is, which are proved wrong? The first thing is high blood, uh, body mass index. Uh, people who have diabetes will have high body mass index and they will be predominantly urban origin. So that is a myth because it is proved from the uh, recent studies that there is no disparity between urban population and rural population as far as India is concerned in case of prevalence of diabetes. It's, there is a very marginal difference between them. Second, even if you are a lean person, you are susceptible to diabetes. There is no link between the body mass index and the diabetes. So we call some people as toffee, that is uh, uh, thin outside and fat inside. So they are called toffee. So there are toffee people who are also diabetic. So this is a myth. Next, mainly a problem in the South India, no more. This is not a problem of South India because people say that you are predominantly rice eaters and uh, North Indians, they, we eat a good amount of fiber, so we are not vulnerable for diabetes. But I'm uh, very sorry, uh, the distribution of diabetes is predominantly, uh, so, uh, it's not between South and North, only Northeast uh, states are uh, coming up with less number of diabetes. Otherwise, the Northeast uh, North, West, and South all are rated similar. Doctors are the key to the management of diabetes in our country, which is a big uh, myth that is not true. What is the role of paramedics is being very clearly mentioned nowadays. And we can play a very vital role, uh, which is equivalent to a doctor, that is a physician or an, a diabetologist in the management of diabetes because doctor, alone cannot manage diabetic load in India. So that is very much clear. So normally what uh, the physiotherapist do is, when you have diabetes, you go and contact a physician. Uh, he will direct you to about the medicines and the exercises and everything. You come for only the exercises. Uh, that is what normally we adopt. That is the situation now, but uh, it is not going to be true anymore if we become a diabetic educator. And this is a very important thing. How often we, uh, give knowledge to the patient about diabetes. Patient self-empowerment is a mantra by which all the developed countries are limiting uh, diabetes uh, numbers, which India is not doing. Maybe because of lack of uh, medical people who can spend some time with the patients or uh, the literacy rate of India, all these things will contribute, but somebody has to take the first step to uh, uh, to curtail this situation, right? So let it be the physiotherapist who can do that. And this is the right day to know about what is the first step we can do in this. Type 2 diabetes is a disease largely governed by uh, genetics. Uh, there are no other co factors. If you think like this, then that is absolutely wrong. You have environmental factors, you have uh, birth weight as a uh, uh, factor. Uh, you have your food habits as a factor, your lifestyle as a factor, stress as a factor, and a lot of hormonal imbalance as a factor, activity as a major factor. So uh, you can't say that I got diabetes because my father and mother got diabetes. Yes, you are susceptible to diabetes if your parents are diabetic, but it is not that you can uh, have a quality of life if in case you have diabetes or you will definitely inherit diabetes from your parents uh, if you think so then that is wrong and if someone says i can i can i have completely cured diabetes so far it is not being proved uh, that diabetes is completely curable one case or two cases here and there which have been misdiagnosed to be diabetes have been cured have been uh, claimed to be cured but so far, there has not been uh, any solution for diabetes as of now for a complete cure of diabetes. So uh, don't run behind. Uh, you have to uh, warn your patients that uh, they should not run behind this Yunani, Ayurveda, Siddha. Yes, they are all good medical system, but there is no solution for diabetes as of now. Yet. And also, a lot of uh, cultural uh, uh, 
tantras for uh, reducing this uh, diabetes or blood glucose levels, dietary solutions, nothing is going to work apart from the triad of treatment of diabetes that is exercise, diet and medication. Now, uh, you all would be wondering uh, where is the, uh, what is the role of the uh, diabetic educator here? And I would like to tell you that uh, in current scenario, a patient will directly go to the physician uh, if he is having diabetic problem and the patient will refer him to the laboratories. Once the laboratory report comes, he will uh, ask him to take up some medication and the patient will go to the pharmacy and then he'll take the pharmacy service and he'll go home. So the physician is not going to uh, instruct the patient whether to have the medicine before the food, along with the food or after the food, how to put the insulin injection, what are the complications you have to look into, what are the side effects of the medications, nothing is going to be taught to the patient. So the patient empowerment is absolutely nil in this sort of a conventional system of patient referral and patient treatment in diabetes. So what is the solution? What is the system adopted by the Western countries, the developed countries in management of diabetes? Is, they adopt something called the physician will, uh, after referring the, uh, after uh, consulting with the patient, he will refer the patient to a diabetic educator. The diabetic educator will spend six hours to 10 hours in evaluating the patient, uh, particularly about the diet, what are the taste of the patient, what he's already uh, taking, uh, what are the physical activity he is doing, how to, uh, by grading the physical activity, what are the complications currently he is having, and very importantly, what is his idea about diabetes, and what is his idea about where he is going to progress from here on. Okay, because nobody is going to give the reassurance to the patient in this current system, but in the new system of uh, referral, the diabetic educator is going to empower the patient with knowledge. So once the patient is being empowered with knowledge and he's not being threatened, he, uh, uh, one minute. Uh, if he's not threatened about diabetes, his perception about diabetes is going to change. Once his perception about diabetes is changed and he understands what is actually happening to him is not a disease by itself, it is a metabolic status. And if he do something, he will land up in uh, good status. If he, do, if he doesn't do that, he is going to worsen. So if, if this option is given to the patient, uh, definitely every patient would adopt the proper do's and don'ts from there on. Instead of that, our current medical system, what it does is, sir, you should not, you should avoid rice, you should uh, walk daily, uh, as if there is no other exercises available for diabetic patients. We, we normally give them the ideas which are old and myths and uh, which are outdated knowledge. So the diabetic educator is a person who is a fulcrum of the diabetic rehabilitation. After spending so much of time with these patients, he's going to refer the patient to the diet counselor. He's going to refer the patient to the physical therapist uh, for exercises. He's going to refer the patient for ophthalmic examination in case if it is needed. He's going to send the patient to the foot care specialist if there is a need. And he's also going to send the patient to the orthopedician or a neurologist or a gastroenterologist whenever it is needed. And uh, by uh, doing so, after doing all these things, he's going to report it back to the physician. The physician may be a diabetologist or a simple MBBS physician. Uh, it's all how you recruit them for your diabetic clinic. Here, uh, in, uh, in my clinic setup, I have recruited a, a physician who is a diploma in diabetic management. And he's a very kind-hearted person and he's a very cooperative person. Uh, and I will report him back all these reports if it is needed. So, in case if there is no need for an ophthalmic examination, I find this patient is not having any functional problem with this and after I'm examining the eyes, I find that everything, I don't have any problem with that. I'm not going to refer the patient to the ophthalmic examination. So, thereby, I'm conserving some uh, the, the cost incurred for the management. In case if I examine the foot and find the sensations are normal and there is no wound, uh, there is no alarming signs for an amputation or a, a, a diabetic neuropathy, I'm not going to refer the patient to the foot care specialist. So the diabetic educator becomes a fulcrum along with the physician 
and he uh, is going to spend more number of time with the patient. Okay, so uh, this is also uh, in the pipeline. The uh, India becoming the, the headquarters for amputation and amputation. We have a very effective role to play in amputation, both in prevention as well as in the management. Okay, now coming to the last section of this presentation, I, I'm not able to give you everything in one session, so I'm just giving you a nutshell of uh, all the presentation uh, or the, uh, the build up of a, a very good course which can be held for somewhere around 20 to 25 hours. So, seven points for a successful diabetic clinic. So, now I will tell you that there is a need for the diabetic uh, clinic, and I have, uh, I have proved that. Physiotherapists can be a very good diabetic educators. What is the role of the diabetic educator? And what are the seven points of a successful diabetic clinic? Now, first is be thorough in diabetic manipulus. Each and everything you should know. You should know how to assess the uh, eye. You should know how to assess the sensation. You should know how to assess uh, the uh, complication, the symptoms of complication. And this uh, will not come only by means of uh, uh, reading and so, uh, experienced physiotherapists are uh, the uh, initial stakeholders for a diabetic clinic and they can very successfully run that. Okay. Next is, a diabetic clinic should function at least once or twice in a week. For example, if you have a uh, physiotherapy clinic right now, you can, uh, uh, my clinic is uh, on leave on Sundays. So what I have converted initially was my, my physiotherapy clinic was functioning as a diabetic clinic on Sundays. Okay, and I was not there. It was it was taken care by some of my friends. Uh, uh, but you can be a diabetic educator on Sundays. Later on, you can increase the number of uh, frequency of days uh, twice or thrice. Most of the physiotherapy clinics do not do a very good business in the morning time. Uh, that's what I have understood. So you can convert in the morning time two or three days. You can convert it into a diabetic clinic or concurrently physiotherapy as well as diabetic education program can happen in a clinic if it is sufficiently large. Next is ensure that laboratory is in good shape. You need to invest at least 80,000 to 1 lakh on laboratories. One processor uh, can do most of the basic diabetic uh, analysis. Okay, so uh, it comes around 80,000 to 1 lakh. So that processor you can buy. Uh, maybe a good company like a Siemens or a Bayer's company you can buy. And you can employ one laboratory assistant who can visit your clinic uh, only on particular time to analyze the blood samples or you can adopt on-call services or initially what we did was we took the blood samples and we uh, we send it to the uh, nearby laboratories but i always recommend you having a laboratory at your uh, clinic with, with a minimal investment if you see extra corporeal shortwave shockwave therapy cost around five lakhs but uh, a full-fledged um, basic community of a laboratory will cost less than two lakhs so you can invest on that Ensure that essential and cost-effective drugs are stored in your place. You, uh, if a physician is coming, you can you can store some basic medicines there. So uh, that you can do because uh, for dispatching the medicines, immediate uh, supply of medications, insulin uh, vials uh, for patients. Uh, it, it becomes a business for us also because there is a good amount of. Uh, uh, what to say profit for the physiotherapist if you are selling uh, insulin and uh, the medical drugs uh, and also the other amenities for diabetic patients like the food price and all those things so it's it's also a business so please don't think that i'm marketing this is all ideas where we can legally uh, and uh, in a cultivative manner expand our things next is develop an effective community outreach program. After doing all these things, if you think the patients will come to your clinic, they will never come. This mistake we did. So what you have to do is you have to reach out to the community. You have to go to the schools, you have to go to the uh, uh, malls, you have to go to uh, various areas, old age homes, and you have to uh, you have to make yourself a brand for uh, treating diabetes in a different dimension. Uh, and you have to bring patients to your clinic. If you have the data of the previous patients who had come to your clinic, uh, for example, if you're running a physiotherapy clinic for 10 years, if you have the last 10 years data, you can just give them a call and you can say that you have uh, started with a, a, a diabetic education program and uh, the first sitting is free of cost and you can just increase the footfall. 
ultimately in the first six months the increasing in footfall is going to be the vital uh, aim of the uh, diabetic clinic and once people start registering you have to you have to charge them on an annual basis you, you should not charge them on a single visit basis because the uh, the uh, dropouts are more in our experiment so charge them on a uh, yearly basis okay and for that very important is community outreach program and uh, ensure a spirit of teamwork and uh, if you can spell this word uh, at the first attempt i would uh, be very happy for you because i i felt it very difficult to uh, read this egalitarianism that means giving specific uh, i think uh, dr ravi prakash would be knowing this <laughs> uh, this is this word exactly suits this particular team because in this team everybody has a role and everybody has a value and if every team member of this uh, uh, diabetic education team respect each other and give their space this team is going to work wonder so there is no uh, space for ego or uh, uh, what to say uh, space given for one particular profession is more and other pro profession is less there should not be this egalitarian uh, should be there in this team then you can prosper and then vertical training keep updating your knowledge a physician should teach a physiotherapist a physiotherapist should teach a physician a nursing staff should teach other people how to uh, clean the uh, wound and scar it is almost like a rehabilitation team where uh, the knowledge sharing is happening and the team meetings are happening regularly uh, it may sound little odd now but once you start with the uh, uh, diabetic clinic and if you get somewhere around uh, 50 to 60 patients you you will find it uh, very interesting to do this so that is what we uh, we have also added ayurveda into this because when i say about wound uh, healing we found that ayurvedic people can contribute much 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 better than the conventional uh, 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 the uh, uh, allopathic uh, management for wound healing so we have also included ayurveda people into this invest 20 to 50 percent of what you are earning initially in improvising the clinic so don't take all the benefits immediately from this this is applicable to any business uh, don't put uh, every investment into uh, this clinic initially uh, just put 50 percent of what you intended initially and then by every month whatever profit you're gaining just invest 50 percent 20 to 50 percent of the uh, money into this improvising the clinic appearance uh, hygiene also increasing the number of uh, workers in your place and that gives more holistic view to this okay if you are not able to do all these things as a physiotherapist sir i am very busy i can't spare my sunday i am so busy plan b give this uh, to a contract to a fellow professional if you have a very good friend of yours who is very trustworthy who can do this thing on his own just give your clinic for rent i have done this uh, uh, to uh, one of my branches where i have let it out on a lease for one of my uh, friend Who's, who was very uh, eager to do this. So you can also contract your clinic for other, for other uh, physiotherapists, preferably if there is no physiotherapist, you can rent it out for a diabetologist, but this idea is vital. So, so what are the common obstacles when you're opening a good diabetic clinic? First of all, uh, obstacle, what I found was finding out a physician who has a like-minded approach and who was ready to work under a physiotherapist planner. That was a little difficult, but uh, my area is a hub of uh, medical colleges. So uh, my fellow batch, uh, same batch, we belong to my same batch. I found him. He is very cardiac good, and we had shared uh, our hostel. So fortunately, uh, he was good enough to uh, be with our team, and he understands the basics, and he doesn't interfere in my liberty. And the laboratory facilities are the major barriers. Uh, you should know. You should be very clear and. Uh, uh, what's the precise in whatever uh, reports you are giving long-term continuation of the paramedical staffs these paramedical staffs particularly the, uh, the lab technicians and the sample people who collect the samples they keep shifting uh, places so that is going to be a big challenge for you lack of administrative and field support if you are the physiotherapist and if you are the uh, diabetic educator also you cannot sit in the front office you cannot do the admin work so you need someone who has to do that admin work so please employ a person with administrative qualities and uh, uh, expect the team that is the peer to support you uh, in all this and select people uh, in that basis for like-minded 
functionality of a tea uh, the increase in footfall is very important so you should have a, a community outreach team which always constantly review around and bringing patients to your clinic and lack of egalitarianism which is uh, also a major flaw you will find it when the clinic is established and running very smoothly then you will have uh, the borders being uh, overlapped and the people start fighting with each other so so the famous words from uh, barack obama the former president of uh, usa pay one diabetic educator 1000 uh, dollars per month he can save 10 diabetic patients related expenses because there everything is uh, insurance so in case uh, how he is calculating is if a patient ends up with an amputation or uh, any other complications of diabetes the us government is going to spend 3 3000 to 4000 5000 us dollars per patient but one diabetic patient who is worth just 1000 dollars per per month can save 10 diabetic patients so that is the meticulous calculation of a uh, best administrator obama so this can also happen in india so uh, i have done this uh, fellowship in diabetic educator program uh, four sessions have completed because of my owing to time and uh, proper platform the fifth program is pending my part as a physical therapist i i have educated somewhere around 100 112 uh, diabetic educators in my career physically as well as in the web platform and i'm so proud on this day that i have contributed a little towards my profession in this way thank you so much uh, for the opportunity and the time given to me and i think i have abided by the time properly and also the pune team and uh, the organizers thane sir thane team thane district team sir sorry thane district team yes thane district thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you so much and now we have a few questions from the audience uh, because of time constraint we'll attend a few so one of the questions sir is what is your take about a low glycemic index food in losing weight um actually this is not in the scope of the presentation but still uh, low glycemic index definitely it is going to reduce weight but uh, how uh, naturally you are going to lose weight by means of going on a fasting because fasting is there in our tradition but uh, fasting is uh, we can't fast continuously and low glycemic index is going to make you fatty and uh, uh, it depends upon individual some people will tolerate some people may not tolerate uh, i always uh, believe in a combination of uh, things in reducing weight by altering the uh, lifestyle incorporating more activity and eating the correct bmr basically metabolic rate is very important based upon that you have to have your food right here it is asked since it's a task to convince people to come for a diabetic rehab in physiotherapy clinic how to approach physicians diabetologists since from there uh, like you know the physios get maximum leads and what are the sources yeah see uh, this is a very good question uh, initially i also thought that uh, approaching a physician or a diabetologist to come to my clinic for a one day visit or a two day visit it is uh, i thought it is invincible but uh, you know uh, 15 years before there was only one orthopedician in a area now there are four five orthopedicians now orthopedicians are coming to door step of a physiotherapist advertising and asking us to refer patients for surgery the numbers not only is inflated in physiotherapy but also in the uh, the, uh, the doctors are also more numbers now and uh, the uh, unemployment and the proper uh, recognition is also lacking in their side but uh, i sincerely uh, tell you you have to flex your muscles and think about your background uh, whoever is good close to you doctors in all these days uh, that's why a person who is 10 years richly experienced in the field of physical therapy practice is eligible for a diabetic educator uh, clinic a diabetic clinic uh, rather than a fresher so if i if i i'm practicing here 10 years means i will know who are all like minded people who will support me in that way you you have to flex all your muscles and uh, you have to just find out the right person for your place yes one last question sir is there any certification or license requirement for setting up a clinic uh, as you said lab and all uh, plus yeah, essential yes you have uh, some uh, legal procedures for that which are very minimal which are not expensive 
uh, except for a full fledged pharmacy uh, the other uh, formalities are very simple so that is what we will guide you uh, in our program how to get the certification for the laboratory minimal basic requirement in the laboratory how much a physician who is a diabetologist can store in his consultation desk uh, medications with what are all the medications we can store what are the uh, bills and the vouchers which has to be generated in selling these things on a uh, what is a domiciliary basis? All these things will educate you when we are doing a diabetic educator program. That is what is very important uh, for you. Yes. The operational operational conveniences uh, of a diabetic clinic. Okay. Fine, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. And on behalf of the Indian Association of Physiotherapists Central Team, the Maharashtra Team, and the Thane District Team. We are grateful to you for sharing such a unique yet need of an art topic with us and the attendees. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, thank you so much. Now we move. Now we move ahead with the next segment of the webinar. As the World Health Organization recommends on the low, on the long COVID rehabilitation, which should include educating people about resuming everyday activities conservatively, the focus and campaigns from the WCPT for this year's World PT Day is rehabilitation and long COVID, in long COVID and the role of physiotherapists in the treatment and management of people affected by long COVID. And therefore, our Thane team member, uh, our Thane team also thought of promoting this campaign initiated by WCPT. I introduce our Thane team member and a well-known and experienced physiotherapist who has been working in the same during the COVID times at various centers. He would share a short talk on the same. Dr. Suraj Shukla, pursuing PhD, in charge principal of VR Nath Pai College of Physiotherapy, Kudal Sindhudur, MPT in Neurology, certified aquatic therapist by IATF Switzerland, worked as a lead physiotherapist in NESCO Jumbo COVID Center, Mumbai, for six months, working on providing PT for COVID and post COVID rehab since May 2020. At present, in charge of COVID care center and post-COVID rehabilitation, Department of MIDC Kudal. Over to you, Dr. Suraj. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nikita. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Maharashtra State Team, for giving us the opportunity to organize a webinar. Uh, and I'm very thankful to the Thane District uh, Team, uh, which is uh, constantly uh, supporting and motivating each other. Uh, so, without uh, taking too much of time, I'll just uh, share my screen. Is my PPT visible to everyone? Yes. Yes, it is. Full screen. So please put on the slideshow instead, it will be better. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. so uh, on the occasion of World Physiotherapy Day, uh, I'm very uh, glad to have this platform of uh, IAP uh, given by Maharashtra State Team and also uh, uh, organized by our own uh, uh, IAP Thane District Team. So I'm going to talk uh, very concisely and shortly on the uh, theme of uh, the uh, Physiotherapy Day 2021 uh, by the WCPT, which is uh, long COVID uh, and the scope of physiotherapy rehabilitation. So firstly, uh, what are the terms used for long COVID are? Uh, the COVID which, ha which is being persisting, uh, the symptoms of COVID, persistent COVID-19, 
the commonly terms used are long COVID, post acute sequel of SARS CoV virus 2, that is infection, uh, the SARS CoV virus uh, infection, uh, shortly known as PASC, post COVID, uh, also known as uh, chronic COVID 19, also post COVID syndrome. The definition given by uh, the uh, uh, National Institute uh, for Health and Care Excellence in UK is the presence of signs and symptoms. The presence of signs and symptoms uh, that develop during the that develop during during or following the infection consistent with COVID-19, which continue for 12 weeks or more and are not explained by an alternative diagnosis. So the signs and symptoms which we observe uh, in a patient. Uh, uh, or the patient complains of we already we already are aware of uh, these symptoms because uh, it's been now the COVID-19 also has passed COVID-20 and now we are in COVID-21. Uh, the symptoms, most common symptoms we already are aware of and we are also, you know, very thorough because if any uh, other person says that I have cold or cough, I have chest pain or I'm having breathless, we, uh, we start doubting that uh, this might be a COVID symptom and uh, you might uh, have COVID. But here, the long COVID means this consistency of the symptoms for more than 12 weeks, that means three months, then they are categorized into long COVID. This includes both the ongoing symptomatic COVID-19, which is from four weeks, that is one month, to 12 weeks, that is three months, and also post-COVID syndrome, wherein the patients are better uh, when they were positive, they had the symptoms, and then they recover, they are fine, and then after a few weeks, that is when, when they complete uh, four weeks, they again start getting the symptoms. But uh, this actually uh, symptoms includes uh, breathing difficulty, hoarse voice fatigue, confused and distracted uh, state of mind and uh, blood clot, etc. So who are these uh, long term or long COVID patients or COVID uh, chronic COVID patients? The basic and the most important and very uh, commonly categorized uh, symptoms of them are persistent breathing issue, olfactory issues that is uh, uh, have impaired uh, smell, uh, olfactory, uh, sense, I mean uh, the capacity of smelling, it gets impaired or they have no uh, sensation of uh, smell. Also uh, who are having taste issues. So internationally they found that the, uh, the people, uh, the patients who had COVID, they actually uh, did not get their taste back even after three months and six months. So this was such a, a worse situation in, in uh, uh, the uh, England and uh, European countries. Uh, also, uh, we know that COVID, uh, the patients who have COVID-19 infection, they are endurancely impaired. So they uh, end up in having fatigue issues, like even a small task or some uh, minimal activity. Uh, they feel, After doing a minimal activity, they uh, start finding themselves uh, uh, tired and uh, there is a, a fatigue experience in them. Uh, fatigue and also body ache is something which uh, after uh, the first wave, in the second wave, they have started uh, having these symptoms of body ache and weakness. Heavy limbs. Nowadays, uh, 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 patients who are who were uh, you know uh, detected positive after uh, a month span, they they find themselves that the limbs are heavy and they are very weak and they are not able to move very you know, uh, pre, uh, flexibly and uh, uh, very uh, smoothly. See, there are uh, these five uh, uh, symptoms which are considered to be symptoms of brain fog, which is a term now uh, which has uh, got recognized by the researchers and, and the practitioners uh, in uh, abroad that uh, the patients who are having COVID uh, infection or the patients who are positive uh, they, after uh, 12 weeks, after a span of three months, they started uh, finding these uh, neurological uh, symptoms in them, which includes memory problems, confusion, problem finding words, like they confuse and uh, when they are speaking, suddenly they uh, take a very big pause and they don't understand that why they are not able to find uh, the word to frame and uh, continue the sentence. Someone, someone might uh, think that this is uh, not a symptom, it's just that uh, some words are uh, out of our, uh, you know, uh, not able to uh, get the words to frame the sentence, but they have documented a lot of studies and in that they found that uh, many or uh, most of these uh, patients who have brain fog issues, they have this uh, issue of uh, finding words. ME and CFS, which I'll be talking in detail further, ME means myalgic encephalomyelitis and CFS is chronic fatigue syndrome. 
this is the most uh, important symptom wherein our role uh, comes into picture and double vision also they have visual impairments uh, so these symptoms these five symptoms these five uh, the complications we can call them as uh, the uh, uh, persistent persisting or developed symptom after the covid 19 these five symptoms if it is present in the in, in a person we call it that they they have brain fog so fog means uh, the blurry uh, situation where we cannot exactly uh, you know confusion uh, problem finding words these are some of the symptoms which uh, makes the brain in a foggy situation so here is uh, Here is a study done by the School of Medicine, uh, Department of Medicine in UK. Uh, they gave this uh, 50 most common long haulers. Long haulers is also a term used for uh, long uh, COVID patients. Uh, according to the you know, uh, frequency or according to the uh, severity of the symptoms, they have categorized and they have sequenced uh, some 50 uh, symptoms, uh, most common symptoms of long COVID out of which I have just uh, mentioned some uh, 2025, uh, which wherein we have to, you know, uh, consider these symptoms as uh, the severe ones and these symptoms are indicating that uh, these uh, 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 patients are categorized into long COVID. So uh, the symptoms are fatigue, muscle or body aches, shortness of breath, difficulty in breathing, Difficulty of difficulty in concentrating or focusing, inability to exercise or be active. These patients after COVID, after the uh, COVID, uh, uh, you know, uh, infection uh, positive, and then after a few uh, span of time, they have this uh, uh, difficulty uh, of uh, being very active or doing any task uh, very uh, smoothly as, as they were doing before the uh, infection. They have headache, difficulty in sleeping, anxiety memory problems, dizziness, persistent chest pain or pressure, cough, joint pain, palpitation. There are some uh, less uh, commonly seen uh, uh, symptoms which include diarrhea, sore throat, night sweats, partial or complete loss of smell and taste, sense of smell and taste, uh, tachycardia, fevers or chill, hair loss, blurry vision, congested or runny nose, sadness, and neuropathy in feet and hand, this is also one of the things which uh, uh, the researchers and the physiotherapists in uh, uh, international country, I mean abroad, they have found that this is the symptoms they are finding in the COVID patients in a, in a later stage. And a reflux or heartburn. These are two studies which I included here. The first study was done in Sweden. They compared, actually, the, uh, the title of the study was Symptom and Functional Impairment Assessed Eight Months After the Mild COVID Among the Healthcare Workers. So, uh, in the healthcare worker team, they had two groups and they divided these uh, uh, groups into one which were uh, having COVID positive uh, cases and the other uh, which were uh, non COVID positive. I mean, they, they had negative uh, results. So, a uh, total number of uh, healthcare workers included in the study were 300. And uh, post 60 days, they compared uh, the COVID uh, versus the non COVID. They found that 26% uh, of the uh, positive, that is, COVID cases, have more than one symptoms. And uh, they found that uh, non COVID, 9% uh, of the patients. So, even though you are uh, COVID positive or COVID 19 uh, ne negative, you have these long COVID chances of. Uh, uh, getting categorized into a long COVID uh, uh, patients group. So after eight months, they again uh, saw the documentation was continued for eight months. After eight months, they found that 15% of the uh, positive cases were still having the symptoms and 3% of the uh, non-positive, that is uh, non-COVID cases that were having system, uh, symptoms. Eight to 15 versus 4% said that the, the symptoms and the uh, the problems that they were facing that interfered with the work uh, socially or at their home life. So this uh, yeah, this concluded that uh, whether you be in the uh, COVID uh, category, COVID patient or no, you uh, have a chances to getting uh, long COVID uh, infection, uh, long COVID symptoms. Now the other study says that 60 day outcome among the patients. Uh, uh, which was done in uh, uh, US, 
So uh, this was uh, done among the patient hospitalized with, with the infection of COVID-19. Here, the number of participants were more and the study was on, done on a larger uh, sample size, 1600 subjects, and uh, it was done 60 days post-discharge. So what they found is 33% of the symptoms, they, they found 33% of the uh, total uh, sample size found the persistent symptoms of COVID and 19% had worsening of the symptoms. And these sub symptoms included dyspnea with stair climbing. Whenever they uh, climb stair, they uh, found uh, to be dyspnea, shortness of breath, chest tightness. This, uh, there are a percentage uh, also mentioned that 17% uh, of uh, the population had uh, a shortness of breath, 15% uh, of them had cough, and uh, the 13% uh, of them had uh, loss of taste and smell. This uh, study was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. These are the uh, uh, several studies which uh, they reviewed, and uh, the next slide will be speaking about all the uh, uh, findings they found. So here you can see I have uh, taken the graph uh, exactly showing out of those uh, systematic review of a number of studies like 16, uh, almost 16 papers were compared and they found that common physical symptoms were 15 to 87 percent of them were having fatigue which continued from the first month till the third month and 10 to 17 percent had dyspnea, 12 to 40, 44 percent had chest discomfort, 17 to 34 percent had cough and 10 to 13 percent had no smell, no taste. So these were the common physical symptoms they found in long COVID cases. Some of the neurological common symptoms were PTSD. Now COVID-19, after the infection, they uh, uh, took it as a trauma. Uh, the patients uh, literally got traumatized by this COVID infection. Uh, so uh, they had this uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder in them, which was continued from the first month and went on uh, continuing to the second month almost. And then uh, 18 to 21 percent have uh, impaired memory. As I uh, told you, these were included in the brain fog. Also poor concentration, 16 percent of them had uh, poor concentration, 23 percent of the total population had uh, anxiety and depression. Areas where we as physiotherapists come into role are cardiopulmonary area. We already know that there was a drastic uh, uh, revolution uh, in the awareness of the people uh, about physiotherapy because of this COVID. And cardiorespiratory physiotherapists, they played a very crucial role in treating COVID infection even uh, during the COVID and also post-COVID rehabilitation. Now, uh, wherein they had this uh, brain fog and other neurological condition, neurological physiotherapists also come into role. We prevent them by, uh, we already know that in COVID uh, infection, there is uh, something called a cytokine storm and there is a possibility of blood clotting and thickness of the blood. So uh, these patients are not at all, uh, uh, you know, active and doing any kind of activities. That's why this blood clot might lead into uh, several uh, fatal conditions like pulmonary embolism or brain stroke. So there, our activity, our exercise, our prescription of exercises, we can uh, prevent uh, complication because of uh, blood clot. And of course, the most important part where we are playing role now, uh, also in the long COVID, is the fatigue. So this uh, long COVID and uh, uh, as I mentioned that uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis and chronic fatigue syndrome, which has been uh, you know, uh, documented and uh, evidence says that uh, this is the most common thing which they are finding in long COVID people. There we, we as a physiotherapist, we play a very crucial role. But uh, in this, uh, 100,000 of people contracted COVID-19 continue to suffer serious symptoms in the long uh, after initial infection. Similarities between the debilitating conditions were myalgic encephalomyelitis, uh, where, uh, you know, the, uh, the five main symptoms of myalgic encephalomyelitis are mentioned is reduction or impairment, inability to carry out normal activities accompanied by profound fatigue. So whatever normal activities, day-to-day -day activities that they were doing properly, uh, I mean, easily before the COVID infection, after the COVID infection, even after 12 weeks, they uh, found it to have, uh, you know, impaired uh, and profound fatigue and uh, they were not very smoothly uh, carrying out the normal daily activities and they used to get uh, easily fatigued. Post-exertional malaise, 
this is actually uh, when they do a, a mild activity or any kind of exercise or any activity any task they do after that task they find found that uh, these cases uh, started experiencing malaise this worsening of uh, symptoms after any physical cognitive or emotional effort so it is not only physical it is also cognitive uh, if they uh, you know so solving any puzzle or if they cognitively they use their uh, brain for a longer time in, uh, in in decision making or abstract thinking or any kind of cognition cognitive activity they found out that uh, they had this post exertional malaise and also any emotional effort made them uh, feel that this is uh, this symptom was noted so also the next uh, symptom we found in the uh, chronic fatigue syndrome patients were unrefreshing sleep even though sleeping for 5 7 hours they were not able to find themselves as uh, refreshed or uh, the sleep was incomplete cognitive impairment as i mentioned uh, about the brain fog and also the orthostatic intolerance which means that whenever the symptoms uh, what he, uh, he or she the patient has whenever the person stands upright or uh, uh, whenever does any movement in the uh, standing position the symptoms it starts worsening it's uh, they they, uh, they start finding themselves fatigued and uh, whenever they lie back lie down the symptoms got improved i mean they got better so this was related to their uh, orthostatic uh, position so that's why uh, termed as orthostatic intolerance going to the next slide what are the common uh, where uh, we can uh, you know document the common measures uh, outcome measures for assessment and documentation because to show that we are uh, treating and we are having some kind of uh, change by physiotherapy uh, and uh, by implementing the physical therapy treatment in this long covid cases we have some of the common uh, outcome measures which is 6 minute walk test time up and go test short physical performance battery is a uh, again outcome measure which uh, includes uh, some uh, mild activities to moderate activities fim and fam scale uh, which is functional impairment measures and functional assessment measures quality of life skills moca is montreal cognitive assessment these are most common uh, outcome measures used to you know document the uh, uh, or record the changes in long covid so rehabilitation this is a poster given by uh, the uh, wcpt this year uh, long covid and uh, rehabilitation in which they mentioned that long covid is a different for everyone the, the, the it might not be the same and a physiotherapist can help you manage your long covid symptoms how activity management or pacing is likely to be a safe and effective intervention for managing fatigue and post exertional symptom exacerbation so uh, this exacerbation means uh, whatever they uh, uh, exercise whatever activity they do after that they find that the symptoms increase so pesc is one of the thing which we manage if we, if we design the activity and implement pacing in between so we can have a, a safe and effective intervention on pesc heart rate monitoring is likely to be a safe and effective intervention for managing fatigue so whatever exercise we are designing or any activity we have to constantly see the heart rate which can be one of the safe and effective intervention graded exercise therapy should not be used particularly when post exertional symptoms exacerbation is present when pesc is present in these long covid cases we should not grade the exercise or we should not give any vigorous physiotherapy in that case also again exercise prescription in long covid plays a very crucial role how and what we have to prescribe in long covid depends on the uh, symptoms and uh, complaints of the patient it should be approached with care to minimize the risk and ensure the exercise programs are restorative and do not make individual symptoms worse so whenever we are giving any exercise if the patient says that the my symptoms are getting worsening or i am finding myself more fatigue we don't have to give that exercise we have to design it in such a way that it prevents the oxygen desaturation we uh, if we are not able to you know uh, we put the uh, pulse oximeter to the patient the covid uh, treatment we see that the oxygen is uh, saturation is improving by therapy but when we find that when we whenever we are giving any activity and the saturation is dropped down we have to prevent this de saturation so we do not have to give any uh, vigorous exercise or any uh, straining or graded activity we just have to prevent the de saturation in these patients a specialist of respiratory physiotherapy may help where there are signs of hyperventilation and breathing pattern disorders so our cardiac respiratory physiotherapist who are uh, you know specialized in cardiac respiratory uh, conditions so they can have uh, they can help the patients here to 
uh, where there are signs of fiber ventilation and breathing pattern in the other. So graded exercise again should not be used particularly when PESE is present. So wish you all a very happy World Physiotherapy Day uh, from my end and uh, thanks a lot for this uh, platform again. And I'm really thankful to the uh, support, uh, support uh, super supportive team of Tane. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suraj. And here we come to the end of this event. And now would like to request Dr. Venkat Ramesh, sir, convener, Thane district team to give a vote of thanks to us. Good evening, everyone. And I'm here to present the vote of thanks for today's webinar. I'd like to thank our guest webinar speaker, Dr. Arunachalam sir, for visiting and enlightening us with his knowledge. Today's lecture webinar was full of knowledge and interesting things. It gave deep insights to the topic and revealed some interesting facts also. The point where Dr. Arunachalam was telling about the diabetic clinic was really informative. I am pretty sure his precious knowledge and will definitely help us for our studies and for future setup also. And also I would like to thank Dr. Suraj for taking out time in his busy schedule and enlightening us with his knowledge. Thank you so much, Dr. Suraj. And I also like to thank our central team dignitaries for giving permission to organize this lecture and webinar and inviting our guests to conduct it. So special thanks to our IAP central team, Dr. Sanjeev Ja sir, Dr. Suresh Babu Reddy, Dr. K.M. Annamalai, Dr. Ruchi Vashne, Dr. Joji Jan, Dr. Nehal Shah, Dr. Sudeep Kali, Dr. Achal Vashi, and also a special thanks to our Maharashtra state team, uh, Dr. Ujwal Evli, Dr. Amit Gire, Dr. Bharti Devana, Dr. Darshana, Dr. Mansi Mehta, and all the EC members. And a very, very special thanks to the IAP digital team, Dr. Uttra Mohan ma'am and Dr. Manisha ma'am. You have really helped us a lot for the digital coordination of today's event. I also wanted to give a special thanks to our IAP Thane team committee who really worked hard to make this event very, very successful. And also, thank you to all the participants present here for paying your attention and learning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Hope we meet soon for the next upcoming events organized by IAP Maharashtra State Thane District Team. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Dr. Nikita. It was a lovely session and we end this session now. Thank you so much. Thank you.